really nice to uh, see some old friends here and uh, some new people as well. And uh, I, my, the title of my talk is <clears throat> Finitude, Possibility, and Relatedness, so they're coming at the end. Uh, critical Reflections on the Path of Being an Existential Psychologist Today. Uh, we're all indebted to Rollo May for, uh, in America for his introduction of existential psychology to, to America and also to humanistic psychologists. Uh, when I think of Rollo as the shepherd of existential psychotherapy, uh, the American shepherd of existential psychotherapy, when he first published Existence, he sought to address a growing dissatisfaction with prevailing psychological models for understanding human beings, suspicious and weary of the dualistic, strictly mechanical and biological ideas dominating at the time, may turn to both cultural studies, literature, arts, and religion, and philosophy, particularly the existentially oriented thinkers, Kierkegaard, Marcel, Nietzsche, Sartre, where he found a more richly textured understanding uh, of the human being and the possibility of a philosophically grounded ontology of the human as human. Um, it's interesting at the time, uh, Rollo had not read Bosses, uh, I mean, uh, not Heidegger's Being in Time, didn't get published in English until uh, four years after uh, existence came out. So uh, what he did was really, even though he said uh, Heidegger's work is the foundation of ontological, an ontological understanding of human existence. But he didn't have access to that work. And uh, had he had access to it, uh, he might not have liked it very much, frankly. <laughs> because he was not that sort of person. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, America had a very ambivalent perception to existence. His own two chapters and some articles and presentations between 1958 and 1961 were very well received in America, uh, particularly among uh, humanistic psychologists who were hungry for a more adequate and appropriate theory and science of the human. Allport wrote that May's existential psychology deepens the concepts that define the human condi condition, invites us to fashion a universal psychology of the human, a Maslow thought May's work enriched, enlarged, and corrected, and strengthened his own thinking about the human personality. And Rogers almost immediately included himself in the emergence of what he called this new existential trend in psychology. Unfortunately, these strong endorsements of May's own works did not extend to the other authors of existence, especially the German-speaking ones. Allport, for instance, complained that the European existentialists were turgid, verbalistic, and reckless. Maslow wrote that he found much in the existential writings extremely difficult or even impossible to understand, and that he personally made little effort to struggle with its literature. Um, he, Maslow went on to say that we Americans need not take too seriously the European existentialists harping on dread, anguish, despair, and the like, and dismissed much of their writing as, quote, high IQ whimpering on a cosmic scale. <laughs> that was last one. Some years later, uh, Irvi Allen was even less kind, but I'll, uh, I'll let that go. Uh, regardless of the ambivalence toward Europeans' admittedly obscure and seemingly abstract ontological language of being, it is clear that humanistic psychology itself has focused from its very beginnings on the concept of being, even though in a more vague, experiential, and not theoretical or philosophical manner. Even a cursory glance of our literature reveals such titles as toward a psychology of being, being becoming in behavior, experiences in being, on being human, a way of being, and the discovery of being, the last being by Ronald May. From these humanistic titles alone, one can safely infer that being is a central concept in humanistic psychology as well. So much so, in fact, that the founders of our third wave almost selected Tony Sudik's term ontopsychology, that is, being psychology, instead of humanistic psychology to designate the approach to which our society today is dedicated. 
No wonder we were such welcome comrades for Rollo. This being the case, why is it that today we seem to be living in a virtual Tower of Babel when it comes to our collective understanding of being and its philosophical suitor, ontology? Why is it that we seem to have no approximately shared linguistic repertoire for these most fundamental concepts of our approach? I suspect the answer lies in part in Rollo May's own personal visions and conflicts. And I'm curious about uh, Kurt, your reaction, and Tom, your reaction to some of the things I'm going to say, because you both know him quite well. Uh, the longest time I spent with Rollo alone was in the last interview he did uh, at APA, and it was in the Humanistic Psychology Hospitality Suite in 1990. And he was, this was four years before his death, and he was, he was uh, really struggling with uh, staying oriented at the time, but, but performed quite magnificently under the stress, under the stress of his kind of intellectual capacities. As much as Rollo asserted our need for a sound philosophical ontological ground for psychology and psychotherapy, he had his own reservations about the Europeans. He wrote he was not an existentialist in the cultish European sense. And as early as 1960, he declared he had no interest whatever in importing from Europe a ready-made system. He was convinced that Americans had to develop approaches indigenous to their own experience and historical situations. But this was a country to which he was writing that was very optimistic, materialistic, uh, dualistic, uh, subjectivistic, individualistic. So this would be European psychotherapy and psychoanalysis would be um, a hard sell here. Rollo's conflicts were not only were not only cultural but also deeply personal, especially with regard to his chosen calling as a psychologist. On the one hand, he was profoundly committed to his work with the people as a practicing psychotherapist, with each individual as a concrete, immediately existing person and with what is existentially real for this given living person. Some of these are just quotes, so I'm not gonna take time with that word quote. On the other hand, he was also committed to developing an ontological foundation for existential and psychoanalytic psychology, clarifying those ontological characteristics or basic structures of being that constitute the human being as human that are given to everyone in every moment and that can give us a structural basis for our psychotherapy. In a phrase, the commitment to this everyday lived experience with clients and to um, the, the person versus his philosophical interests in a phrase, he was caught in a quintessentially existential ontic ontological conflict. So the ontological understanding of the human being as such, Rollo May's incomplete project. In the last analysis, it seems that Rollo's pr pragmatic American spirit and preference for the vitality of everyday life overshadowed his philosophical ambitions. This was so in keeping with his own personality, even at the cost of his theoretical ambitions. As a person, he consistently declined arcane philosophical argumentation, preferring instead, as he put it himself, to be an existentialist and to speak directly from his own experience. Nearing 60, Rollo acknowledged that he did not write for his colleagues and fellow psychologists. Instead, he chose to write for a larger public of intelligent, open-minded, questioning, motivated writers. Adding explicitly, I do not aim to write theory for its own sake. In these autobiographical comments, one sees how deep his commitments to his relationship with patients and a wider American public eventually left his abiding commitment to a foundational ontology for our field, though not forgotten largely unfulfilled. So where does this leave us today? What are the critical challenges on the path of becoming an existential psychologist and psychotherapist in 2015? Here are three more specific questions. I'll try to answer them briefly. Um, 
The first question is, where are we today with the challenge of developing a shared linguistic repertoire regarding a systematic understanding of being and being human, a foundational ontology of the human as such? That was Rawls' view. Lamentably, at this point, we have so, no such shared, coherent linguistic repertoire for being, a comprehensive, comprehensive, systematic understanding of the human as human and as a whole upon which to build a foundational existential approach to psychological science in service. To be frank in answering the question, I think we're slit seriously foundering, if not entirely lost. Though in Europe and other places around the world, I see promising things happen. We were just coming back from the World Congress on Existential Therapy. We've got a, a listserv where they are really trying to come to terms with the foundational matters and concerns of what existential, what an existential approach really means. And, and they know their stuff, both practically and philosophically. Um, as, as it seems to me that we Americans apparently have no taste for the ontological or even critical systematic philosophy. I felt pretty alone in this, uh, in this task and have spent uh, some years trying to rewrite psychodynamic uh, phenomena in hermeneutic phenomenological terms, dreams, transference, resistance, repetition. I've been trying to get to a more ontological basis for understanding these kinds of things. So, second question is, where are we today with developing a distinctly existential phenomenological approach to psychotherapy based on a systematic regional ontology of the human? Contradicting my own teacher, Larry Boss, it seems to me that existential ontology offers such a radical, revolutionary understanding and relational understanding of the human being that we can no longer cling exclusively to standard psychoanalytic practices, as Boss suggested. However, since we are already floundering in our present ontological understanding of being in general, and the human being in particular, we're even farther behind with respect to developing a systematic approach to psychotherapy based on such an ontological grounding. Actually, I think our colleagues in contemporary relational approaches to psychoanalysis are more advanced and sophisticated, sophisticated, sophisticated and integrated uh, thought and practice. To catch up with them, we need to realize what Raul May's own unfulfilled dream of developing an ontological foundation for depth psychological science and practice. Third question. By the way, this is an invitation. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm begging us to do this. <laughs> and I think one of, the, one of the difficulties with existential psychology not showing up as much in uh, introductory psychology texts and personality theory texts is because we have not taken this kind of systematic foundation more seriously. Um, now, counseling psychology texts and psychotherapy texts use uh, almost always refer to existential. So, um, so how might the realization of these systematic foundational challenges inform, vivify, and strengthen our immediate therapeutic engagements? Uh, what might such a practice look like? Don't. How are we doing on time? Um, you have two or three minutes. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to do that. So let me just say uh, something about uh, uh, three things. Let me just, yeah, I'm just not going to be able to get to the, to the whole paper, so uh, let me just say something about two of the concepts. Finitude. Every person who comes into my office does so complaining in some way in which they feel circumscribed, constrained, trapped, or held hostage in their lives. They don't generally use these words, but instead, instead speak of concrete, everyday circumstances, specifically relationships, habits, addictions, money, mood, medications, uh, work, creativity, fi family dynamics. They never, unless they are ambivalent or about therapy or about closeness, mention philosophy or even psychology. The concerns of the stuff of their everyday life, what it's like to be in their skin, their own quotidian world, specifically what it's like for them to suffer, be disappointed, confused, lost, or simply unhappy in the myriad ways we all do from time to time. 
Though their complaints are very individual and particular to themselves, they also ines inescapably express what is common to all of us, namely our universal and ubiquitous finitude, the, unavailable, the unavoidable confinement of being human. O oh, ubiquitous finitude, that fundamental ontological human characteristic that structures and defines our time in this life, and that designates and embraces, embraces all the inherent limitations of our human existence, our very own and at the same time universally shared thrownness, mortality, transience, uncertainty, culpability, incomprehension. One of our primary tasks as existential therapists is to see and show how the individual's particular troubles always point back to their humanity as a whole, to the conundrums inherent in being human at all. And why, you would ask? To understand that our frailty and finitude, to endure with full awareness the awesome and awful contingencies of time and of our being in the world as we are, to experience our anxiety about being at all, or to know in advance that the price of our living is having to die are almost unspeakable existential burdens. But to understand these are not simply personal faults or afflictions, but in fact our human heritage and hope is the gift of understanding what it is for us all to be human. The gift of adequate existential ontology based on lived experience can provide. Now, the, the balance to that, of course, is possibility. That in the face of all, everything that, that is true about our finitude, even death, uh, we have many possibilities for understanding, interpreting, responding, acting. So possibility is also is an equally powerful existential. And it may not be much in compared to our finitude. It may not be much. But as Freud said of, uh, of, the, uh, of consciousness, finally he was forced to say that consciousness was worth something. And he finally said, well, consciousness, not like, like life itself, uh, may not be worth much, but it's all we got. <laughs> <laughs>